Um, hello and welcome to the final Oxford Forum for Questioning Extremism's event of Michaelmas Term, Dialogue to De-Radicalise, an interview with the one and only Daryl Davis. Um, Daryl Davis has lived a unique life, um, promoting and playing for the likes of uh, Chuck Berry in rock and roll and blues bands, but also alongside this, he was the infiltrator and engager of Ku Klux Klan members. He describes himself as the impetus for many of them giving up their role within the organization. Um, I'd like to say today a big thank you to T45, our new news service providing the facts you need in this age of misinformation. Today we'll be in conversation for around 40 minutes, 45 maybe, leaving 15 minutes at the end for questions from the audience. I'd like to start this talk by giving you, Daryl, 10 minutes to explain to us what dialogue to de-radicalize means to you and how you put that into effect over your career. Sure, thank you so much for having me there. Really appreciate it. Well, you know, my, my background as a child was being the child of parents in the US Foreign Service. So I spent a lot of time from age three through my early teenage years living abroad in various countries. You get assigned to a country for two years, you return back home here to the States for a little while and then get reassigned to another country for two years, back and forth, back and forth. Today, I am a, in, my, in my adulthood, I am a professional musician, also touring the world. And when you combine my childhood travels with my adult travels, I've been now in a total of 57 different countries around the world on six continents. And I have been exposed to a multitude of ethnicities, cultures, religions, et cetera. And all of that has helped shape my perspectives. And I can tell you something, no matter how far I have traveled from my own country, whether it's right next door to Canada or Mexico or halfway around the world and been exposed to people who speak different languages, they look different than me, they may have different religions or beliefs, et cetera. When I return home, I conclude one thing, and that is we all are human beings. And as such, we all want the same basic five things. We want to be loved. We want to be respected. We want to be heard. We want to be treated fairly. And we want the same things for our family as anybody else wants for their family. And if we understand that and apply that wherever we go, regardless to our own fellow uh, citizens in our own country or abroad, if we employ those things, we will have an easier time navigating those societies with which we may not be familiar because we do have those things in common. So to answer the question uh, you asked, how do I employ dialogue and why is it so important? A missed opportunity for dialogue is a missed opportunity for conflict resolution. And oftentimes we are going to encounter conflict and disagreement when we encounter someone who may not have the same belief systems as we do, whether they are abroad or whether they are here domestically. And so I use those, those, uh, those core values to get to the heart of, of the people with whom I'm having dialogue or having opposition. And I try to frame the, the encounter more as a conversation than a debate. Yes, we are going to debate things because we disagree. But I don't say, hey, let's debate this. You know, because as soon as you use that word debate, the walls go up and people are ready to engage in, you know, in some form of, of attack. And it, it may be not, not necessarily violent attack, but it could be, you know, their, 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 their back is up. And so they're ready to defend something and they don't even know what it is, but you said the word debate. So, well, I prefer to use the word conversation an exchange of ideas. I wanna know what you think about this. I wanna know how you feel about this. Let's just share, help, help me to understand, educate me, enlighten me. And this way it brings the temperature down and it allows for, the, for, the, for your opposition, your adversary to hear your points of view as well because you are now listening to them. You're giving them some of those core values. You're giving them respect, you're allowing them to be heard and you're treating them fairly. Now, when I say respect, this is very important. Uh, you know, I, I engage a lot with uh, white supremacists. Obviously, uh, there are a lot of things we don't agree on, 
and you know, but we can find things to agree on. And so I am giving them that respect of allowing them to air their views and allowing myself to listen. So I'm allowing them to be heard. That is not to say that I respect what they are saying, but I do respect their right to say it. So that's that's what dialogue means to me, effective dialogue. So really, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting point about how we need to respect people to kind of be able to get to the crux of what it is that makes them have that view in the first place. Exactly. So, so perhaps you can explain to our audience what it is that makes somebody join the KKK or any other vitriolic, hateful group that um, just wants to start uh, you, an idea. You well, froze on me. You froze on me for about ten seconds. Absolutely no worries. I just I was saying, what is it that what's going on psychologically, environmentally, experientially that is motivating somebody to become a member of the Ku Klux Klan or any other vitriolic or hateful group? Sure. And in this country in particular, uh, a Klansman or Klanswoman or white supremacist, uh, to whatever group they want to belong to or just even as individuals, they are not stamped from a standard cookie cutter. They come from all different walks of life, all different educational backgrounds, socioeconomic statuses. It depends upon their environment, uh, their family life, what books they read perhaps. Uh, if somebody reads the wrong book and goes down that rabbit hole and you know, out they come. Um, for example, in some cases it's like my grandfather was in, was in the Ku Klux Klan. My, my father was in the Ku Klux Klan, so I'm in the Ku Klux Klan and my kids are gonna be in the Ku Klux Klan. So it's a family tradition passed down. In other cases, uh, the family <clears throat> has nothing to do with the Ku Klux Klan. They're totally non-racist at all, but their kid ends up being in the Klan. It could be the environment that the kid is in, his peers, where he lives. Perhaps some of those kids and their parents uh, belong to these types of beliefs. And so they assimilate. It's like a gang. You move into a neighborhood and the gang lives there. You either join the gang or you get beat up or you, know, you don't do business. So it could be that kind of a thing. If you move into a town, say as a businessman, and the town is prevalent with, uh, with that kind of uh, mentality, you, you have to assimilate. You join the local country club, you join the local chamber of commerce, you join the local chapter of the Ku Klux Klan, you know, if you wanna do business there. And in other cases, uh, which is also pretty prevalent, you take a, a, a depraved town, let's say a coal mining town, and where people have worked the coal mines for generations. You know, your father worked it, your grandfather worked it, right out of high school, you go to the coal mine and you dig coal and you're happy. You're not racist at all. You're, you're making good money. You're paying your, your rent, your mortgage, you're putting food on your family's table. All's good. You don't have a racist bone in your body. But then the company in this rural town uh, gets the bright idea. You know what? Now, now, most coal miners in this country are white, by the way. So this company, the company that owns the mines or whatever, they get the bright idea, hey, you know what? We can lay those people off and, and, and give the jobs to some of these immigrants coming in here. Either they're legal or illegal immigrants, doesn't matter. They give them those jobs because they figure these people will work for a lot less money. So the company will save you know, huge amounts of money by laying off these uh, white workers. So they do that. And now the, uh, the unemployed, the people who got laid off, they can't find a job because they're not qualified to do anything else. All they know is mining, digging coal. That's all they know. If you give them a vacuum cleaner and say, you know, vacuum this, this carpet, they wouldn't know how to do that. They know coal, that's, that's their thing. So they're, they're unemployable. They're not making money. The bank is knocking on their door for, for their loan, for their mortgage or whatever. Um, and, and they can't feed their family. The clan will see things like that. And the clan will come to town, to those towns and hold a big rally. And they'll say, look, you know, nobody stands up for the white man, but the Ku Klux Klan. The, the blacks have the NAACP, the Jews have the ADL. You know, 
you used to have a job over there at that coal mine and now you don't but some and they use some you know racial epithet for a black person or hispanic person now has your job and you cannot put clothes on your kids back you can't put food on your family's table because this person has your job your job is not gone but you're gone come join us we stand up for the white man we will get your jobs back mm -hmm. so these people who were never racist you know they're thinking well, you know, they have a point. My job's not gone. It wasn't like the job got terminated, but I'm gone and somebody else has my job. Why? Mm -hmm. What do I have to lose? Give me an application, sign me up. So people join that way as well. So mm -hmm. there are many different ways people join. And as I said, it, you know, it, when, when you see these people on TV, on some of these afternoon talk shows, you know, yes, they are the very ignorant people who are throwing chairs and uh, very uneducated. And yes, those people do exist. Many of them do. But there also have been members of the Ku Klux Klan who rose to the level of president of the United States. President Warren G. Harding was sworn into the Ku Klux Klan in the green room of the White House. Harry Truman, right before he was president, uh, joined the Klan for a short time. He did not like it. He got out. Um, Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black, was in the Ku Klux Klan when he got the appointment to be on the Supreme Court as, as a justice. Uh, he had to leave the Klan in order to sit on the Supreme Court. So, I mean, there are all kinds of stories, governors, senators, all this kind of stuff, as well as third grade dropouts. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, for me, I've picked up two particular understandings of uh, radicalization there. One of them is this kind of traditional element of the Ku Klux Klan that's part of kind of America's historical heritage, you might argue. Another one seems to be that existentially, when things happen to you, that brings your life into a point where, you know, not, you, there's, there's no sense of coherence beyond joining this group that are going to support me, that for that ideology to crystallize in those circumstances, you're going to become very attached to it. It becomes part of who you are. So how do you get somebody to de-radicalize that? Surely it's not just one conversation. I mean, surely it, it takes a, a long time. Yes, and and you know you made you made you made my point right there. Uh, you know people go and join this group because they're going to take care of them. Uh, back to what I said, one of those elements is being treated fairly. So you know the company is not treating you fairly if they get rid of you and you've been there for generations doing a good job, uh, you know serving them by mining this coal, and now they get rid of you and hire somebody else who maybe has no experience. Um, so that's not being treated fairly. And now here's somebody offering you fair treatment. We know we'll take care of you, we'll get you your job back, et cetera. So you have to be able to communicate with these people and show them what is wrong. And at the same time, be taking steps to write the existential stuff, make it right. And point out to these companies, you cannot do this to people. So you have to defend the person who is being oppressed and not only support them, but also work towards getting the oppressor to see their wrong and change their attitudes. That is where the strength lies. And people see, this is the real person taking care of me. Because they would have gone and joined the Klan a long time ago. They're joining the Klan or this uh, supremacist group out of desperation. Mm. And, I mean, and that's, this that's not them. This reminds me of something. Um, there was one family that you met on a talk show, um, and they were a family of KKK members, or maybe they were Nazis. I can't remember precisely. But you, well, the father went to jail, and you helped the mother out and yes. drove them to down through Chicago, uh, Illinois, to to the to the correctional facility or wherever he was, um, and then that's what uh, allowed that woman to kind of re change her views. Um, exactly. Was, was that you helped her, that you provided that material support that she lacked um, in her life? I treated her fairly despite her beliefs, and her beliefs were not positive towards me. But I'm able to put my emotions behind me instead of letting them get in front of me and, and be an obstacle towards my developing a positive commu a communication or dialogue with my adversary. That's very important. You must keep those emotions behind and not put them in front. I'll give you, I'll give you an example of something of how, of how this works. For example, when, uh, when I'm interviewing these people, like when I wrote my first book, 
I just finished writing my second one. But when I wrote my first book, you know, I'm going around interviewing clan leaders and, and uh, members and things like that. When they first enter the room and they see me, their wall goes right up mm. because I am not the object of their affection. I am the object of their hatred. You know, they are superior and I am inferior. That is their, their mental attitude. That's what makes them a white supremacist because they consider themselves to be supreme over people like me. So when they see me, their wall goes up and they're ready to attack or radiate you know, negativity towards me. So we're sitting down and I'll say, you know, so you know, why, why do you hate me? Why do you hate people who look like me? You don't even know me. Well, Mr. Davis, you have to understand something. You know, black people are prone to crime. And this is evidenced by the fact that there are more black people in prison than white people. Now I'm sitting here two feet away from this person, this Klan leader, and he's telling me this. Now, what he is saying is indeed true. In this country, there are more blacks in prison than white people. But what he is saying is also a half truth because he is not considering the imbalance of our judicial system here in the United States that punishes darker skinned people more so than it does white people who are in control of the prison systems and the court systems and the judicial systems all right, and, and law enforcement for that matter. All right, so he's not considering that. He is seeing the results. One's perspective is one's reality. All right, and, I, and there's gonna be a lot more on that point here in a second. Mm -hmm. Next, he tells me that uh, black people are inherently lazy. We do not want to work. We prefer to scam the government welfare system. We always have our hands out for a free program or free handout or whatever. And then he goes on to tell me that black people are born with a smaller brain than white people. The larger the brain, the more capacity for intelligence. And so since people like me have a small brain, we're basically unintelligent. Uh, and he says, this is evidenced by the fact that black students uh, consistently year after year score lower on the SAT scores than white kids. SAT over here means a scholastic aptitude test, which you take in, in high school before you go to college that helps get you into colleges. So, you know, I, I'm sitting here listening to all this stuff. Is, is what he is saying offensive? Absolutely, it is offensive. Am I offended by it? Absolutely not. And the reason why I'm not offended by it is not because it's true. I'm not offended by it because it is not true. You know, this man doesn't know me, yet he's calling me uh, a criminal, he's calling me lazy, and he's calling me unintelligent. Why would I be offended by a lie? I know who I am. If my mother or father were to say, Daryl, you know, I think, I think, you know, you're kind of, you know, criminal oriented or, and you're lazy and, you know, you're kind of dumb. Maybe I would take that into consideration given the fact that they brought me into this world and they raised me, but not somebody who just walks in the room 10 minutes ago and sees me for the first time. And all he sees is this, my skin color and makes these assertions, okay? My goal is to bring the wall down because I could have, you know, he, he is not used to, to putting out all this vitriol and not having any pushback. Usually when he talks to somebody like me or a gay person or a Jewish person or whatever he hates, within 30 to 45 seconds, that person is pushing back, you know, defending themselves and trying to attack that person. And if it goes on too long, it, the, the attack could be, or the pushback could go from verbal to physical. Mm -hmm. And then the whole thing would just be devolved and no, no productivity. So I'm, you know, I'm sitting back listening to him. I'm allowing him to be heard. I'm showing him that respect. I'm not respecting what he's saying, but I'm giving him the respect to say it. And I'm treating him fairly. So now the wall is coming down because when the wall is up, he's like this. You know, he's he's going to shut me out. Nothing I have to say is going is to sink in. So now the wall is coming down because I'm not pushing back. He's been thrown off his game. He's letting his guard down. And after he has exhausted 
all of this vitriol, then he feels compelled to reciprocate and allow me to make my point. Because after all, I gave him all this, you know, let him make his point. So now it's my turn to speak. I would be well within my right to go on the offense and attack him and say, no, you are the criminal. You are the one hanging black men from trees and bombing black churches and dragging black men behind pickup trucks. And I would be 100% correct. I just stated some facts. The Klan has a history of doing that. And you can see that history, all right? So I would be right. But if I, if I went on that kind of attack, the wall would go right back up and he would shut me out. So rather than go on the offense, I go on the defense. And I say to him, I said, listen, you know, I hear what you're saying. However, I don't have a criminal record. Nobody in my family has a criminal record. I have never been on welfare. Nobody in my family has been on welfare. And I'm as black as anybody else you've ever seen. And as far as my brain size goes, I have never measured my brain size, but I'm sure it's the same size as anybody else's. And as far as the SATs go, my SAT scores were high enough to get me into college. I have a college degree. And I say this knowing the person sitting across from me barely made it out of high school. But if I throw that in, into his face and say, look, I got more intelligence in my little finger than you and your whole clan put together. And I would be right. Mm -hmm. I know I'd be right. Okay. That's factual. Yeah, that is factual. Okay. But if I did that like that, the wall will go right back up. So I want to keep the wall down. I talk about myself. And as a result, as a result, and I've heard this many, many, many times over the years, as of next year, 2021, I have been doing this work for 37 years. All right. And here's what happens. The person goes home and, you know, they reflect upon, you know, whatever transpired during the day. And they think, man, I had a three hour conversation with a black man, you know, and we didn't, we didn't come to blows. You know, that's, you know, that, that's never happened before, you know, and then they think, you know, what that Daryl Davis said about such and such is it, true. And, and what he said about this, that, and the other is true, but then they have, but he's black. So they're having a cognitive dissonance. They realize what I said was true, either because they found it out to be true or they already knew it to be true, but they don't want to accept that the truth came from a black person because how is it that they're white and they're supreme and they didn't know this and now they've learned it from somebody who's inferior. Mm. So they don't want to accept the truth coming from a black person. So they struggle with that. And the struggle may be for months, it may be for a year, maybe a little more than a year, but depending upon how invested they are in this uh, ideology or in this group, if they are a leader, they have power and they have followers. If they're just a, a plain rank and file member, they don't have a lot invested, all right? So eventually they have to decide, do I disregard Daryl's skin color and believe the truth because I know it's to be true? and change my ideology, change my, my direction, my path? Or do I consider the fact that he's black and continue living a lie? That becomes the question they have to answer for themselves. Fortunately for me, most of them, not all, but most of them have, have changed and have taken the truth and gone in that direction, which is what I was hoping to accomplish. And like I said, here, here, here it's very important about perspective and reality. One's perspective is one's reality, all right? Whether, the re whether that reality is right or wrong doesn't matter. If that's your perspective, that is your reality. So we should not try to change someone's reality. We cannot change somebody's reality. What we can do is offer them a different perspective. And then when they see that perspective and they weigh it against their own, and their own doesn't make sense, then they change their reality. They change their own reality. So I offered him this the perspective, hey, listen, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying there, there, there are, there, you know, that, that, that there are uh, less black people in prison than white people. What he said was true, but I'm giving him the perspective. They're there because of the imbalance. You know, I, I'm not a criminal, I'm black. Um, my SAT scores got me a bachelor, bachelor degree uh, from, from, a, from a good university and I'm black. 
So my, apparently my brain you know, is okay. And you know, they don't consider the fact that, again, you know, where do most black kids uh, go to school? Most black kids in this country go to school in the inner city. Most white kids go to school in the suburbs. The inner city schools are not as good as the suburban schools in terms of the quality of education. That is a fact. Now, I can tell you this. That's why the majority of black kids score lower than the majority of white kids on the SAT scores. But let me point out something again, because of the perspective thing, that's his perspective. He sees those results. Here it is. The black, black kids who go to school in the suburbs, they score just as high as the white kids, if not higher than some. White kids who go to school in the inner city, they score just as low as the black kids, if not lower. So this proves that it has nothing to do with the color of someone's skin or the size of their brain. It has everything to do with the quality of the educational system into which somebody is, is enrolled. Right. So that's what I point out. I don't, I don't attack him. I just point out you know, how it worked for me. Yeah, so, you're, so, so, so as I understand it, your policy is to, 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 not, to not push back, to kind of disarm in a way, to give that yes. person the position where, they, where you, you can now, you say, you say give your own perspective, but I would perhaps interpret that as just, just give them facts, to give them truth, to educate them. Absolutely, um, and I do push back, but mm. you have to know when to push back. You cannot push back when the wall is up. I mean, you know, you're not gonna go and, and, and break a wall down by banging your head onto it, you know, but you can educate somebody by putting your head into them when the wall is down. Hmm. Right, right. So, but this, this approach, I suppose, is predicated on this, on allowing, on complete free speech. You're allowing this person to say, all, to say all sorts of nonsense, I'll put it in scare quotes, <laughs> but, you know, vitriolic um, ideologies, attitudes, so forth so, and so on, which as you said yourself personally, you don't find as offensive. And I might chance that m many people would be offended by it um, and might not be able to transcend the language that they might feel personally attacked by it. What because would you say to what would you say to those people though, to try and to get them to come out of that? They are offended by it because they're told to be offended by it. This is an insult. When somebody calls you this, they don't like you. You know, so so you 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 should be offended by this. Uh, you know, we need to to revamp how we perceive things. We got to change our perspectives. In other words, we have to know who we are. You know who you are. All right. You know, it, it doesn't mean that you're on an ego trip because you have high self-esteem. All right. We have to know who we are going into these situations. I know who I am. And when I walk into a room full of white supremacists or even one, I know that person has certain perceptions about me that are not accurate and, th and that are gonna be flat out lies and insults. So I know to keep my emotions intact mm -hmm. because what the person is gonna say is not true. Why allow myself to be, to be offended by a lie? You know, nobody can hurt you. You can only allow yourself to be hurt. So would you they, say- I mean, they would, can hurt you physically, yeah. but- Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But would you say stuff like, um hate speech law, for instance, do you think that's appropriate then? Or does that make it difficult for you to do what your job is and kind of push back and de-radicalize, but that being based on and allowing somebody to just to, to be honest about what they actually believe, regardless I, you know, of the genesis? I believe that, you know, hate, hate speech law depends upon, you know, and it's very ambiguous in this country. And, I, and let me just get to that in one second. Back, back to the self-esteem person part. Mm. If you know, if you're going into an adversarial situation, and it doesn't have to be about race, it could be about anything. It could be um, about abortion. It could be about global warming, um, the nuclear weapons, the war in the Middle East, the current presidency over here in the United States. These are all hot topics. You're on one side, somebody else is on the other side. All right. No, before you go in read up, study, do whatever you got to do to absorb the other person's point of view. Understand where they're coming from. Where do they get this perception? What are their beliefs? Whether they're factual or, or opinions, 
understand them before you go in so you know what you're dealing with, all right? But then, and equally as important, know who you are. Have your self-esteem in check. Because if you don't know who you are, when you walk into that room, they're gonna tell you who you are. And depending on, upon where your self-esteem is, you might believe them when you walk out. So, you know, you gotta know where you are. But also have an open mind, you know, that if something that they say makes more sense than what you have believed, then take that into consideration and check it out and make sure it's factual. And if, if it turns out to be factual, regardless for how long you believed in it, accept it as truth and be willing to change, you know, your, your, your idea. I mean, for years you believed in Santa Claus, you know? Yeah, for a few, for a few, for, for certain. <laughs> Until last um, year, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, this conversation is kind of making me rethink it right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I was just wondering what your thoughts on, okay, about now in America. It seems like we're living in an incredibly polarized time. To what extent are we having a conversation or, or are your people having a conversation right now? There, we're having more conversations right now than, uh, than ever before, which is a good thing. You know, the problem that we have in this country with racism is our own fault. Okay? We brought this upon ourselves by not addressing it decades ago. Yes, we've tried in, you know, in, in other situations, okay? I'm not, I'm not you know, um, uh, degrading any, any of the, of the past efforts by any means. People like Martin Luther King and many others have tried, okay? But people on the whole, other than leaders, I'm talking about people in general are now having these conversations more so. Yes, we have cancel culture, but that is not as great as people wanting to find out what's going on, especially in the wake of George Floyd. These, these things should have been addressed many years ago, but other than the leaders like King and Rosa Parks and many others, whites and blacks, who, who dedicated their lives to having these conversations, the public citizenry, all right, did not. They preferred not to talk about that. You know, just keep it under the carpet, lock it in the closet. You know, you know we don't talk about things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in other words, if we turn a blind eye and we don't see it, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. you know, like, like a lot of people thought, you know, really thought racism was over when Obama became president. It absolutely was not over, you know? Mm -hmm. We've come a long ways, but we still have a long ways to go. Now, back to the hate speech. Determining what is hate speech or, or, or what, uh, what can and cannot be said, there's even racial bias around that. For example, uh, our First Amendment gives us freedom of speech, but you know, we can say anything. You know, we can call the president a crook if we want to, and, you know, and we won't get locked up for it. Uh, in some countries, you speak out like that against the president, you, you could be beheaded or executed or put in jail, whatever. Um, we don't have that here. We have that freedom of speech. But we also now have some exceptions to freedom of speech, certain things that we cannot say or we will be locked up. For example, uh, we cannot shout fire in a crowded theater unless there is a fire. The reason being because it will incite a riot. If people will panic, you know, you're supposed to walk to the nearest exit. Of course, who's gonna walk if there's a fire in the theater? Everybody's gonna run. And they're gonna trample over each other trying to get out and somebody's gonna get injured, possibly hurt. So if there is a fire, fine, shout it so people can get out. But, it is, but if there is no fire, don't be shouting fire in a crowded theater as a joke because you will cause people to get hurt. And, and for that, you need to be punished. So that was the first one. Then later we added another one. You cannot shout hijack or gun in the airport unless there is something going on because you will incite a riot again. People panic and they, you know, act all, all bizarre and, and hurt people. So those are exceptions to freedom of speech. Now, why is it that the KKK and the neo-Nazis can march through a Jewish neighborhood or a black neighborhood and shout, uh, in a megaphone, and I've seen it, I've been there, I've watched them, shout, you know, six million was not enough. We're gonna ship all those N-words back to Africa. That is hate speech. That's gonna cause a riot in a black neighborhood. And I've seen that happen too. So why are those people uh, allowed to say that? Why, why are those words 
not uh, put on the uh, exception rule because of racism in this country. Now, personally, I don't believe uh, that, uh, that we should have hate crime laws. I know that's very controversial for me to say that. Um, I believe we should have laws strong enough to punish people severely for any uh, aggression or transgression they commit uh, against someone else that puts that person in danger or hurts that person. In this country, the Supreme Court ruled, we have the right to hate, but we don't have the right to hurt. So in other words, let's say, uh, let's say you are my next door neighbor mm. uh, and, uh, and you don't, something I did you didn't like. And so you throw a burning tire on my lawn you're going to be charged with, you know, arson or vandalism, destruction of property, burned up my grass, whatever, this hot rubber burning tire on my lawn. Yeah, you know, I'm just being hypothetical here. Your, your, your fine might be $500 and maybe, uh, you know, a weekend in jail. Um, but for the same offense that you consider that I did to you, you come over to my lawn and you, and you stick a burning cross in my lawn. That's a hate symbol. You're going to go to jail for a few years and you're going to be fined thousands of dollars just because it was a cross that was on fire as opposed to a burning tire or a burning piece of paper or something. All right. That's because you have committed a hate crime. Why not up the, uh, the sentence for the burning tire? Because that, that, that shouldn't be done either. You know, let's make punishment more severe. Let's cut out this three strikes you're out business. You know, right. you, you, you get, you know, you, you know, you should not be driving drunk. So the first time you get your license suspended, second time, you know, you, you might go to jail. Third time it's revoked or whatever. Let's cut that stuff out. Let's get to the crux of the matter. You know, you should not be driving drunk. You're driving drunk. Boom. Your license is gone. That would straighten people out. You burn a tire on my lawn. You're going to jail for years. So the, mm. because some people, they will go and do the extra because it's their badge of honor. They want to commit the higher crime as sort of their initiation or their, their dedication to racism. Hmm. So it doesn't, so it shouldn't matter whether it's a cross or, 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 or a tire, anything you've done to, to, to offend your neighbor this way and hurt their property should be severely punished. I think let's, let's talk a bit about, um, about structural racism because you've made a lot of many allusions to it throughout this um, interview so far. Um, there's a really poignant moment in your documentary from 2017, Accidental Courtesy. Um, I encourage anyone to watch it if you haven't already. Um, and where you sit down with these BLM activists and they, to, be, to, to all intents and purposes, didn't really want to talk to you. They didn't want to engage with you. They found it really difficult. Um, I kind of understood that as their point being, you spent almost, th you spent 30 odd years um, talking to KKK people, talk, calling them your friends. Um, and they thought that you could have been doing more, putting your resources and energy into um, the, the black community who was, who was suffering and who still are to this day. Um, how did that experience impact you? And did you think that they kind of misunderstood what the point is of your work? They absolutely misunderstood the point of my work. Um, you know, they're, these are the people who march back and forth in front of the uh, police station with a megaphone screaming out for justice and equal inequality and stop shooting black people and this that, and the other. And you know, there, that is right. We need, we need that to stop. The police need to take a look at what they're doing. They know what they're doing. They need to stop that kind of behavior. All right. And these people deal with a lot of the systemic uh, issues on racism. Racism is multifaceted. There's individual racism, there's institutionalized, there's systemic, et cetera. They deal predominantly with, this, with the uh, systemic, but that should not negate the fact that individuals who are racist also have to be addressed. And what is um, hypocrisy with them was this. They're trying to, to, to stop police from being racist. They, they, they were born, that, that particular group was born out of the uh, murders uh, by police officers in Baltimore from, uh, from Freddie Gray, who was murdered by the police, all right? Uh, and I get that completely, but are they doing anything different than I'm doing? Um, they're trying to stop 
white police officers who practice racism. I'm trying to stop white Ku Klux Klan people who practice racism. And when they stop, they are my friends. And some of them even come out with me on the stage when I give lectures and renounce their organization and speak out against what they stood for. How many police officers have these guys converted or impacted or influenced? How many police officers are willing to march down the street with them and, co and come out on their lectures and say, you know what, I was a Baltimore city cop for 50 years or 20 years or whatever. And, 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 the, and these people uh, showed me the light. And now I, I renounce the practices of the Baltimore city police and I'm gonna take off my uniform and give it to you. I have police uniforms, okay? Yeah. The grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan was a Baltimore city police officer. Robert White. Robert White, he got out yeah. of the Klan because of me and he gave me his robe and hood and he gave me his police uniform. This is a man who on the police force tried to bomb a synagogue and then later was charged with assault with intent to murder two black men with a shotgun. Yes, he went on to become one of my best friends. Now, the approach that I, that I did with him, I did, not ex I did not accept what he did. I did not forgive what he did. I did not condone what he did, but I treated him with respect. I allowed him to be heard. I treated him fairly. I showed him friendship, something that obviously he had not seen before. And that is what brought around that turnaround. Mm. So I'm not saying what they're doing is wrong. I'm saying they should not be bashing what I'm doing. And in fact, right. a, uh, a year later, they reached out to me and said, hey, you know, um, I've been checking you out, whatever, you know, I, I wouldn't do what you're doing, but I, I, I get what you're doing. You know, let, let, let's get together and talk. So we met for dinner. We met for dinner. We got along fantastically. And um, one of the guys began, you know, inviting me out to, to, you know, to talk and came over to my house and all that kind of stuff. And then he got freaked out and he fell back and he reverted back to what you saw in the movie. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the young guy, he and I are still friends and stuff. The older guy, he fell off the wagon. But, you know, it happens. It happens. Uh, I know, I, I also realize they have not had the experience that I've had. Mm -hmm. And if you recall in the movie, uh, the, the scene where the young man uh, from BLM first met me was in the parking lot and we were handing out food to the homeless. All right. And I was introduced to him. The first thing he said in the movie was, I understand you're the first black member of the KKK. Those were his words. Now that to me is ignorant. Obviously you know nothing about the KKK. If the KKK had black people, there wouldn't be a KKK. The KKK was formed because of black people at the end of the civil war. What was the civil war about? It was about black people, slaves in particular. They wanted to keep slavery. The North said no. It was, it was all about black people. Mm -hmm. So obviously he got some bad information and he did not check it out. So he was operating on ignorance. And I pointed that out in the movie. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it became very contentious, all right? But uh, it, you, know, you only saw eight minutes, almost nine minutes in the movie. That scene went on for almost an hour and it almost, right. became, it almost became physical. It right. almost became physical and also uh, he made the point, uh, he, his point, that a white supremacist cannot change. I've proven that they can. So again, you know, that it was not factual. He is not, at, at a, he was 21 in the movie. At 21 years, I was, I think, uh, 58 or something. Um, at 21 years of age, he has not had the experience that I have, just because he's been arrested on the street for, for disobeying a police order to cease and desist or whatever, does not give him 50 years experience, I'm sorry. And I think he realized that when he contacted me a year later. Uh, he's grown, he, he sees yeah. things a little differently now. Um, he may not agree with everything that I do, but uh, some things he does, and I, I think that's good, he, he's, he's growing. I understand his point about systemic racism, but you know what, we all have to work together to address these problems, but because there is no one solution that will solve all of racism. 
Um, yeah, yeah. Can I can I interject here? Sure, on absolutely. That, on that on that point. Um, also, we'll be coming to questions from the audience in five or so minutes. So if you've got a question, just press raise hand, and I can I'll meet you in our final segment. Um, what I was going to say was uh, this point about how we've got to work together because um, one of the kind of currents at the moment within anti-racist thought is that you need to check your own prejudices, that you need to educate yourself. And the idea there being is that we need to encourage individual responsibility in apprehending racism and fighting it and combating it, which to all intents and purposes seems like a smart idea. But also your kind of approach seems to be not necessarily the opposite, but from a different angle. You go arguably above the call of duty going to KKK rallies where I'm sure you'd rather be playing jazz with your friends um, and and that your attitude is arguably quite different in the sense that you feel that you have to go out of your way to relive arguably some of the trauma of racism to be in the face of a, a racist who's going to spit some vile thoughts in your direction that you to uh, all um, praise um, don't get offended by so how do we encourage people to synthesize both perspectives? How do we get an individual sense of responsibility in terms of people educating themselves, but also a sense that we can go out as well and educate others? Okay, so, so the reason I, I gave you my background uh, at, at the very top of this uh, conversation about my travel and things like that uh, is, is key to why I do this and how I do this. Um, as I said, you know, overseas, my classes were filled with kids from all over the country. This is in the 1960s. You know, my, my classes were, were multicultural. I had Japanese kids, Nigerian, Italian, French, German, Russian, whatever. If they had an embassy in those countries, all of their children went to the same school. That was my first exposure to school, was, was a multicultural environment, all right? And then when I would come back home after my dad's assignment, I would be in either all black schools or black and white schools, meaning the still segregated schools or the newly integrated schools. And there was not the amount of diversity in my classroom that I had overseas. So when I was overseas, I was literally living about 10 years into the future because that scenario had yet to come here, that multicultural scenario. Today, you walk into a classroom in the city, uh, in, in any city here in the States, you see you know, multicultural people but not in the 1960s. I was seeing it in the 60s overseas. So I knew it could work. I, we got along fine. We didn't have any racial problems. So I knew this could work. So if I can get along with people from all over the world, why can't we get along in my own country? This is what I'm trying to impress upon people who've not traveled. And hmm. my travels do not make me a better person than anybody else. It simply gives me a broader perspective than those who have not traveled. My favorite quote of all time is a quote by Mark Twain called the travel quote. And Mark Twain said, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. And that is so true. I cannot make them see what they've never seen but I can show them an example and, and they can see it vicariously if they're willing. But understand something, a white supremacist hates a white person more who is involved with a black person than the black person because this white person has sold out their race. You are, you are a race traitor. You, know, you, you have defiled yourself because you're uh, you know, romantically engaged with somebody outside your race. It's the same thing for black supremacists. A black supremacist hates me a lot more for engaging with white people than, than, than he or she hates the white person. Because, I, because in their mind, I'm an Uncle Tom, I'm a sellout, I'm a race traitor. Mm -hmm. And that's what you were seeing in that movie. So, so in a sense, we, uh, we need to be able to kind of understand each other better. And that comes yes. from it, it broadening your horizons, traveling around the world, etc. But... We're living right now in a in a COVID universe where everybody's yeah, locked you know in what? their own home. You're right. Okay, but yeah. we have the tools right here. I'm sitting here talking to you, you know, in Oxford, and I and I'm right outside of Washington D.C. We have the tools, even during lockdown, to to, to travel the world without even leaving our leaving our house. Mm. We have the internet. We have Google. You know, listen. 
you're you're a lot younger than I am. I'm 62 years old. When when I had to do a a book report or or do something like that, write a paper. Fortunately, I you know my parents could afford a set of encyclopedias. We had encyclopedias in the house. I go downstairs, pull one off the shelf, you know, look up whatever subject it was, and write about it. If I needed more stuff, then I had to leave the house, go to the library, and get different books on the topic, and and draw from there and write my report. Today, nobody has to leave their house to write a report. They just go on onto Google, you know, onto the internet, and they get all the information they want. So we can travel the world, and there's no excuse to not use the tools you have at your fingertips to learn something different and get out of your little bubble, whether you're on lockdown or not. Well, one of my my final question will be um, before we go to the Q and A, um, and just raise your hands, guys, if you've got any questions. Um, you say that there's no excuse, and a lot of people now are talking about the sense of intergenerational trauma. Um, it's a it's the idea that we kind of relive or at least specifically for black people you relive the trauma of your ancestors when you see pictures of racism when you hear issues about when you see images of george floyd with with uh, the the knee of a police officer on his neck and for them they don't want to relive that and i think that seems like a pretty rational and understandable perspective to to be in um do you echo the same sentiment or do you think that they that sometimes we just have to go beyond our call of duty, even if, even if that means embracing a lot of pain. You want to know the truth? Absolutely. Okay. I think a lot of the younger generation that are talking about that are full of crap. Okay. I don't, I don't buy it. I don't buy that they are reliving intergenerational trauma. All right. If, if they were back, if, if the situation was around more in their day, if this has happened to their parents or something like that, then yes, you know, quite, you know there, there is inter, intergenerational trauma, but I think the, young, the younger generation today is too far removed to be living the trauma of slavery or, or the lynchings from the 1940s and 50s and things like that, okay? If, you know, if your grandfather was lynched or your, or your, or your father was lynched, yes, you, know, you, you, know, you, you would definitely feel something if you saw a picture like that, no question about it. But uh, you know the term intergenerational trauma is, is a new term. It just came out within the last uh, few years. So why is it just coming out now when Black people have been here since 1619? So I think it's just an excuse. It's, it's an excuse. It's an you know, interesting, get, an interesting get, point. To get over it. <laughs> get over it. And 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 you know, listen, listen. I am a descendant of slaves. I was born in Chicago. I was only born in Chicago because my father had a job there at the time. My parents are from Virginia. Virginia was the seat of the Confederacy. My great grandfather was a freed slave. All right. So I'm a descendant of slaves. I have, you know, not been affected by intergenerational trauma. I'm fully aware of what has happened in my family. And sure, it makes me angry, but it's not going to stop me from succeeding. And I think that is just another tool and another thing to, to, to make an excuse for why somebody can't succeed. Yes, you can succeed. You're gonna to have to fight racism. Racism is real, it does exist. It, it exists in, uh, individually, it exists systemically and institutionally in this country. But you know, if, if, if you think intergenerational trauma is, uh, is preventing you, then you're just preventing yourself, that's all. Well, I'm, I'm sure it's- so you know, you're in your 80s or 90s, something like that. Right, um, sure. Well, I'll leave it up to anyone in the audience to challenge Daryl on this final point. Um, I'm going to come to our first member of the audience, Maddie. I'm enabling you to talk, and you can ask your question directly to uh, Daryl. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that. It was amazing, very insightful. Um, I, I'm currently doing a master's in anthropology, and I'm looking at, um, I want to look at far right extremism. Um, so within that, the KKK and the Nazis. Um, and I was just wondering if you'd ever encountered any women in your sort of years of doing this incredible job. Um, and sort of, have you found their worldviews or sort of outward expressions of white supremacy to be any different to the men that you've um, obviously spent a lot of time with or just more generally, like, do you have any insights into how gender or masculinity femininity um 
manifests itself in these kind of white supremacist circles? Absolutely, Maddie, and thank you for the question. Uh, yes, there are plenty of women involved in these things. Uh, in fact, I was just with a former neo-Nazi female a couple weeks ago, and uh, you know she's out of it now, and I know many uh, women in the KKK uh, and other uh, white supremacist type women. Now, here's the thing. Uh, men, white, white men, in, you know, obviously who, who run these organizations, not only are they racist and anti-Semitic, they are also very male chauvinistic. And so women are subservient. And for whatever reason, it's very unfortunate, women uh, accept those roles. They accept those roles, just like in biker, in biker gangs, you know, the pagans, the hell's angels and things like that. Women are secondary. You know, they don't hold leader, uh, leadership positions. They may hold positions, but they're lower uh, because in order for these men to survive in their mind, they have to have somebody that, that is not quite their equal. That way it puts them on top and everybody else is below. So the ones closest, closest to them, of course, are females. And then outside of the females are the blacks, the Jews, the Muslims, the gays, the whatever else they don't like. But their closest ones, um, they have to rise above them. And so they are very uh, male chauvinistic, but yet there are women in these positions. Now, why are women there? Uh, some of them, many of them truly believe in, 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 what, the, in what, they, what they preach, you know, that white people are, are superior and this, that, and the other. And then there is a segment or percentage of them who are simply involved because my husband is involved or because my boyfriend is involved. So, you know, they're, they're doing it to support, you know, the man in their life and they, and they just go along with the program. Some of them don't even believe in, in what it stands for, but they go along with the program because they love this guy who is involved. And so, you know, again, you know, that, that shows a, a thing about self-esteem and perhaps poor choices in boyfriends or husbands. Thank, thank you, um, Maddie, for the question. Um, why again, we're gonna, I'm allowing you to talk now. If you unmute yourself, you'll be able to ask a question to Daryl. Cool. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. sir. Perfect. I'm um, first and foremost. Um, yeah, you're you're a much better man than than I am. So your story is absolutely incredible. Um, the quick question I wanted to ask was, um, you know, there's been fairly recently, perhaps, there's been an idea going that black people cannot be racist to white people, um, due to I guess the kind of foundation of the argument is because in general in society, black people are, are, are in a lower position than white people and therefore they're not limiting a white person from, for example, getting a job. Um, so the idea is that a black person can be um, prejudiced to a white person, but they can't be racist in terms of, I guess, systemically. Um, so I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on that and also whether do you see interpersonal or kind of local racism as a more significant problem than systemic racism, or do you, do you judge them more differently or see them more or less the same? Okay, to, to the point of can black people be racist? Yes, absolutely black people can be racist. And um, you know, you have uh, reverse racism as they call it. Uh, but you know, the only reason why there is, re reverse racism cannot exist without racism itself. Nothing can be put into reverse unless it's already gone forward, right? By the law of physics, you can't you can't go backwards unless you've already gone forward. So you so you must have racism first before you have reverse racism. So yes, there 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 are black racists. Uh, they are, they are called black supremacists, and uh, and they you know and believe it or not, black supremacists and white supremacists they get along. They get along fine, because they each believe in separation of the races and they do not believe in miscegenation. So fundamentally, they agree with each other. And there have been um, black supremacists and white supremacists who have spoken at each other's events before. So uh, Tom Metzger, who just passed away a couple weeks ago, was a devout white supremacist. Uh, I knew him, uh, he, he was the found, well, he started out being the grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan under the imperial wizard, David Duke. And then he and Duke had a falling out and Mesca broke away and he formed the group WAR, W-A-R, which is an acronym for White Aryan Resistance. 
I'll look him up sometime. M E T uh, M E T Z G E R Metzger. Anyway, um, he uh, he got sued by uh, by the SPLC for the murder of, a, of an Ethiopian in Portland, Oregon, and so forth. Um, he has spoken at some of Louis Farrakhan's uh, things. Louis Farrakhan has spoken at some of uh, his things. So you know you talk about black supremacists and white supremacists. Fundamentally, they agree with each other. They don't they don't you know like each other because of the color of the skin, but they agree on principles. All right and um, the second, uh, the second question was, uh, do I consider the individual th thing to be just as important as, as a systemic or something like that, is my understanding of the question. Yes, all facets of racism have to be addressed. And, you know, people accuse me, well, why, you know, why are you spending so much time with these people when you should be trying to fight the systemic thing? Um, listen, it all has to be fought and understand something. The systemic thing only exists because of the individuals that are within the system. The system does not run itself. Man runs the system. So if you change the, the man behind the system, the system will change. That is why in this country, it is so crucial as to who gets nominated and appointed to our highest court in the land, the Supreme Court. You know, you don't hear all, all this news coverage of somebody getting appointed to a district court. Nobody cares about district court judges. They care about the Supreme Court justice because that is the system by which all the laws trickle down to this country. And if you have a conservative man up there or a racist man up there, we're gonna see it trickle down. And that's why we want a balance up there between blacks and whites and men and women so that we have a balance trickling down. <clears throat> so yes. Um I'm just going to come to one final question, Daryl, because we have gone slightly over. No problem. Hi, Cameron. You want? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sir. Hey, you. Oh, yeah. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Daryl and Freddie. Thank you. Very important. Um, I just wanted to push you a little bit on that in an intergenerational trauma point because. I'm thinking if on the one hand, we're all agreeing that when we're talking to the KKK member, when we're talking to the misogynists, we need to be diligent, we need to take care, be careful to bring down those barriers. I, I'm wondering why we don't have the same thought process when we're talking to the person who believes or, or has a natural reluctance to accept white people because they feel like they're experiencing intergenerational um, racism. Why? 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 Why can we say you know? It, it that doesn't matter. Why can we say get over it? Why are we not coming with the same kind of energy of wait? Let's bring down those barriers, and and have a proper conversation about this. My well, my feeling is that it is psychosomatic uh, when you have many many generations removed. Okay, sure. Um, you know when when I when I see pictures of black men hanging from trees. You know, I, I feel an anger in me. I feel a bitterness, you know, I, but I've seen a lot of that. That does not stop me from becoming who I am. You know, I, I, I do not lower my self-worth and think, oh, you know, you know this is oppress, uh, oppressing and I, and I go into a fit of depression and, and don't wanna deal with it because it's gonna affect my progress. No, it does not. Uh, listen, we have the, the American um, National Holocaust Museum here in Washington, D.C. Um, of course, the Holocaust did not happen here, but we have that museum uh, here. And everybody should go see it. And uh, there, there are, and, and in fact, you know, Jews have, are closer, are closer in time to their uh, trauma than Black people are. You know, the Civil War ended in 1865. The Holocaust ended in 1945, at the end of the Civil War, I mean, at the, at the end of the uh, World War II. Uh, but yet Jews will go there. Now, not, I'm not saying every Jew will go there because many of them have lost their, their, uh, their parents or their grandparents in the Holocaust. Very, very traumatic, absolutely. And, you know, they don't want to go there and see the piles of shoes and the pictures and all these kinds of things. But their children go, their children and their grandchildren go, and they learn from that, and they learn what has to be done to prevent it from happening again. 
I have a very good friend who lives right down the street from me. She's a Jewish lady and she belongs to a group that brings together the children, the adult children of Nazis and the adult children of Holocaust survivors. That's how you get over intergenerational trauma, all right? Martin Luther King said, uh, and I'm gonna paraphrase, in, in his I Have a Dream speech, he said that he had a dream that one day the, uh, the sons of slaves will sit down to the, to the table of brotherhood with the sons of slave owners. That was in his I Have a Dream speech. Get over whatever you think is intergenerational trauma. Um, it, it, it does exist, but I don't think it exists for the youth of today. I'm just gonna give Cameron the opportunity just to respond here, because I think this yeah. is such an interesting topic. Yeah, no, it's a very interesting question. But then I just wanna follow up and say, I think me especially, and a lot, a lot of people listening to this, Sure. We'll be thinking this is a this is a conversation about how do we speak to KKK members, the misogynist? How do we stop them from having those barriers? But I think then maybe it would be interesting to question whether another group that we need to add to that is the person who thinks, you know, has that thinks they're experienced that 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 trauma. I maybe agree with you. About about those black people who do have those views themselves. I, I agree with you, Cameron, hundred percent. I mean, anybody who is experiencing trauma needs to be addressed. You know, we cannot discount them, but we also, and, and, I, and I say, let's try to help them. But the first thing we have to, do, to, to determine is, is this real or is it psychosomatic? Because they're told how they should feel when they see this and, the, and they're responding likewise, just like giving somebody a placebo and you tell them it's, it's a certain medicine, they're gonna behave differently. So, you know, we have to determine, and I'm not a psychologist or sociologist by any means, but, uh, you know, that, I would leave that to, to the people in that field. But to determine, are they really experiencing this? Um, you know, and there are ways that we can detect this, or are they just reacting to something because everybody else reacts to it? You know, so like, you know, you go to a movie and you're told, you know, this is the sad part. So at that suggestion, women start tearing up. You know, it may not be sad at all, but they're, they're crying because the person next to them is crying because this is supposed to be sad, so this is what I do. Uh, and I'm sure there are some exceptions, of course, who do feel certain things. I have felt certain things. Let me just give you an example of something that I felt. True story. Um, I played a, a judge's uh, induction into the circuit court here a few years ago, and I um, it was, an, it was an old courthouse, way old courthouse that wasn't even being used anymore. It's like, it like now a museum. And so my band, at that time, all the guys in my band for this particular gig were white. I was the only black guy in the band. There was one guy in my band who was white. You would never suspect him to be anything else. But when you hear him sing, he sounds black. He, he just had certain black nuances in his voice and his delivery of songs. And I always thought, you know, there has to be some kind of black in him somewhere, even though, you know, the, I, I know his whole family, there's no black person there, but somewhere down the line, some, there was some black person. Anyway, so uh, he was gonna meet us at the gig because he had something he had to do earlier. So he was coming from a different direction. All my band guys came to my house, they all got in my van and we drove about two hours to this gig. And there's this long driveway to this courthouse. And, uh, there are these two stone columns at the front of the driveway. As soon as my van crossed in between those two stone columns, I got a, sh a, a chill going through my body. Like, whoo, what was that? And everybody in my, I I'm driving. And uh, everybody in my band says, what's wrong with you? I said, you all feel that? They said, no, feel what? I said, you didn't, you didn't feel your, your body vibrate or chill or whatever, shiver? No, what are you crazy or something? Are you sick? No, I'm not sick. Well, none of them believed me. None of them felt that I was the only one. I don't know what was going on. Anyway, we go on up to the, uh, to the stage, big, big outdoor stage. And by the way, those of you who are in England, um, one of the people who also played uh, on, on this thing, we were two, two entertainers, my band and this other guy. And, uh, and I got him to sit in with the band. He was the Queen's bagpiper, Major Walter Wilkie, who was the Queen's uh, chief bagpiper. Uh, he was there for this induction. And anyway, so we pull up to the stage, 
and it's, an, it's a it's a wooden platform that's been you know erected just for this occasion, and it's backed right up to the cemetery. So right behind me, where I'm playing the piano, are all these gravestones right behind the stage, and and the restroom is inside this old this old court building. So um, you know we're setting up and sound checking, and my guitar player shows up. <clears throat> He's bringing his amplifier onto the stage, and he says, "Man, I just had the weirdest experience." And uh, someone, somebody said, what? He goes, well, I was pulling in the driveway. I said, don't say it. I said, did you, did you get a chill? He goes, yeah, how did you know? I said, I got that same chill. He got the same thing that happened to me when he, when he crossed uh, in, between those two stone columns. And so that tells me there's some black in him. Anyway, so as, uh, on the break, I had to go to the restroom. So I go inside this courthouse and I asked one of the docents, you know, where's the restroom? And um, he tells me, when I come out, I'm, I'm making a joke with him. Like I said, there are all these headstones and graves behind the, the uh, stage. And I said, are those the graves of, of people from, from way back who were, who were sentenced to death uh, by, by, by some judge here in this courthouse? And you all just buried them out back there? And I'm just making a joke. And he said, no, uh, the, 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 those are, are, are the, uh, are the uh, graves of, of dead slaves. I said, ooh. Oh, because slaves were sold on that courthouse steps. They were sold to people who bought slaves for their, for their plantation. That those could have been some of my ancestors, you know? But uh, in any event, I felt that chill when I pulled in that driveway and my guitar player felt that chill. Thank you. So Darryl there's your the intergeneration trauma. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great story. Um, I mean, thank you for this entire event. You've let us run over as well. Um, it's been absolutely fantastic to hear you talk today. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, it, it really, really, really is. You're very much welcome uh, back on the OFQE's platform at any time in the My future. My pleasure. Anytime. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, guys. It's been a fantastic first term. We're so happy to have capped it off with this great interview. We'll be back next term with a, with a great term card on new events for the future. So thank you very much, Daryl. Signing off. The OFQE. Take care. Bye bye. Take care. Cheers.